Memory is one of the most interesting and complicated topics in neuroscience. It's so fundamental to our existence and how we function in the world. It builds and shapes us in ways that directly impact our behavior, enabling us to recall our past and learn for the future. But what is memory really? And how does it work? I want to start by telling you about an important case study from the 1950s that has gone down in neuroscientific history. A man named H.M. was a patient who suffered from a severe form of epilepsy and was treated with something called a bilateral medial temporal lobe resection. I know that's a bit of a mouthful, but let me take you through it. A resection means to surgically remove something, and in this case, the area of the brain that caused HM to have seizures was on both sides of the brain, predominantly in his temporal lobes. The temporal lobes are the parts of the brain located on either side of your head, just above your ears. In treating epilepsy today, we begin by using anti-epileptic drugs, which work by dampening down the activity of neurons in the brain. Sometimes people have forms of epilepsy that are resistant to drug treatment. And that's when we sometimes offer them resective surgery. This has proven to be the best outcome option for patients with multi-drug resistant epilepsy and can often achieve complete seizure freedom if the affected area of the brain is located and removed accurately. So, after HM had his procedure carried out, he became very forgetful but he still managed to maintain his normal general intellect and could perceive the world as normal. What was interesting was that although he couldn't form new memories, he was able to remember things from his past absolutely perfectly. The loss of memory is known as amnesia, and whether it's anterograde or retrograde depends on the direction of the memory loss. So either you can't lay down new memories, and that's anterograde, meaning forwards, or you've forgotten past memories, which is retrograde, meaning backwards. This case provided evidence for two main ideas. First was that memory formation is an individual aspect of cognition. And second, that the temporal lobe has a super important role to play in memory. It wasn't until the 1980s that we discovered the structures within the temporal lobe that are crucial for memory formation. These include the hippocampus and a few structures close by that all sit a bit deeper in the brain. Nowadays, we can use a form of neuroimaging called functional MRI or magnetic resonance imaging to see which areas of the brain are more accurate and active during specific memory tasks. This usually involves verbal recall activities and can also indicate other parts of the brain outside of the memory center that assist in recall. Of course, there were several more patient cases that progressed our knowledge about memory, but it might be more interesting to talk about some of the mechanisms that help us form memory on a cellular level. Before we get into this, we'll have to start with some basic neuroscience, starting with synaptic plasticity. Neurons have a cell body and a tail-like structure which we call the axon. When neurons connect with each other, the end of an axon meets with a cell body to form a link. A small gap exists between each of these links, and we call these gaps synapses. It may be that each neuron is connected with several thousands of other neurons, all passing electrical signals to one another via synaptic connections. It's believed that the strength of these connections can vary depending on the amount of activity that happens at each synapse. This idea that strength of synaptic connections can change is called synaptic plasticity. And the fact that they vary with electrical activity gives the theory its name, activity-dependent synaptic plasticity. So, the more two neurons fire electrical signals at each other, the more likely they are to form a connection that promotes long-term memory formation. The type of activity-dependent plasticity that promotes the strength of a synaptic connection is called long-term potentiation. Animal experiments have shown that after stimulating neurons in short bursts at high frequency, synaptic strength can be enhanced and that connections become more efficient for the future. Essentially, a synaptic connection that has undergone long-term potentiation will create electrical activity more easily in the firing neuron. This means, probably, that you're more likely to recall the memory that causes those neurons to fire, 
and this also helps you learn. On the other hand, low levels of activity at a synapse can cause the opposite of long-term potentiation, and this is called long-term depression. This weakens the synaptic connectivity between two neurons. What's important is the timing of the electrical activity that happens at the first neuron and the second one relative to one another. If the first neuron is stimulated repeatedly and causes a knock-on effect within a few milliseconds in the second one, this will induce long-term potentiation. However, if repetitive electrical activity arrives at the second one before the first one is stimulated, this can cause long-term depression. This is a probably oversimplified mechanism, because if you imagine we have about 86 billion neurons in our brain, and those form over 100 trillion synapses. So you can begin to see how complicated these neural networks probably are and become, and how they function to allow our brains to become so incredible. Something that scientists are still really struggling to understand is how short-term and long-term memory are so different to each other. It seems obvious that they should be conceptually distinct from one another, but our theoretical ideas don't seem to be able to separate them out so clearly. One idea suggests that short-term memory is a cognitive system that temporarily holds various types of information. These short-term memories can then be activated and transferred into a kind of long-term memory system. But patients with damage to their short-term memory can often still remember and learn new tasks that have a familiar quality to them. These could be old memories that are retrieved from long-term storage already in place, or they could be learning associations between two things that are already a little bit familiar to them. The ability to learn new words, for example, or repeat the order of a new digit sequence is very challenging. From this evidence, the logic follows that whatever happens in the short-term memory may be buffered and has to be presented to the long-term memory before it can be remembered. The matter does get a bit more confusing here though. There are examples of patients who've had damage to their long-term memory, but preserved their short-term memory. If it's a requirement that information from the short-term memory has to present itself to long-term before it stays put, it doesn't make sense that these patients maintain their short-term memory without long-term memory. Maybe there's some sort of overlap between these systems, and one aids the other in either short-term or long-term recall, depending on the task at hand. The strongest evidence for a short-term system is actually our ability to repeat nonsense words like blunterstaping that we've never heard before. It may be that we use pre-existing constructs of sounds and syllables that we've learned before and are stored in our long-term memory, and that enables us to encode short-term memories. For the moment, things are still a bit confusing within the neuroscience, and memory is such a complex and fluid system that integrates into so many aspects of cognition. It's really difficult to piece the whole puzzle together, but luckily we're making progress, and it'll take time but one day we'll be able to unravel all of the mysteries of memory. We'll just have to wait and see. Tell us something that you'd like to know more about in the comments below. Don't forget to like this and see you next time.